Welcome to the panel discussion on Vedic chronology for WAVES 2020. It is my privilege and honor to have uh, the four people on this panel whom I admire the most. And they know each other and I've known their work for a long time. And it is only uh, a wonderful to have everybody thanks Corona virtually. Otherwise I know uh, Kalyan Ramanji does not travel much as does uh, Arun Upadhyayji and, and, and I think even Narhari Acharji has some uh, reservations about traveling. So this kind of gives us uh, I, I virtually uh, no chronology, no time needed and for this, even though we are going to talk about Vedic chronology, but today, today we have become almost uh, a devas, you know, we are just appearing and we can appear and disappear whenever we want. So um, I, I mean, not really that much introduction is needed, but nevertheless, I think just for antiquity, uh, I, I need to just give a brief introduction to each one of you. And starting with Niles Oak, who is otherwise really a, a business professional, but you know, sometimes it is now coming to fruition that uh, what your real nature is, your near real nature is eventually shows up. So even though he has done, uh, it has been in corporate world for a long time, but he, he finally got to his um, interest in Indian uh, tradition, culture, and philosophy. And the, the, the way he chose is to study more uh, astronomical uh, chronological uh, determinations of some of the, the, the major events that may have happened uh, over a long period of time. And so that's what he now writes and, and that's what he speaks about. And he's bringing some very, very new perspective, not just because he's young, but also because he has many things which are, um, uh, it seems like, you know, other, some other people ought to know. Uh, then we have um, uh, Dr. S. Kalyan Raman, who I know, I mean, I learned a lot from him uh, since I was at University of Massachusetts where I started uh, the Indic studies and a and lot of uh, conversation. He actually visited us there and, and, and gave uh, one of the WAVES conferences, he gave talk um, and he has been associated with the WAVES. But he also is a person who has uh, made uh, to the calling of his nature. You know, he was also in business. So happens that he was, he was a, in the Asian Development Bank. And then, you know, he left that uh, work and has used his time to do uh, a lot of work. He is he's director of Saraswati Research Center, where he's uh, um, a lot of work. He's known for Saraswati River civilization idea and that eventually, you know, he, he was visionary. He thought about these things ahead of time, but you know, now everybody except that there was a Saraswati River. And uh, he has been continuing to that kind of work. So I'm so pleased that he, I, I'm able to see him again. And then we have Dr. Narhari Achar, who is a physicist actually. And in Memphis University, he was a professor of physics. He also took on uh, to this idea of astronomical calculation using planetary software. And uh, he was someone who for the first time at least showed that the date is long before what European scholars have uh, suggested at do using computational uh, information and, and uh, astronomical dating. And that was very helpful to a person like me who otherwise uh, is interested in the culture and, and uh, civilization, but not knowing exactly, not being a hist history a student, not knowing that much. So as a scientist, it was so easy for me to connect with his numbers and I used it all along, all the, all the way until I also learned from uh, Niles that you know, there are some other interpretations of it. But both of them are in at least, you know, talking about a long before then what I think the Western world has uh, acknowledged about Indian civilization. And then finally, I want to introduce um, Arun Kumar Upadhyayji, whom I have known uh, from his uh, such a, a beautiful way of interpreting writing and quoting, you know, it looks, at, it looks like, you know, he was, uh, he, he was meant to uh, precisely define anything and everything in such a nice and detailed way that you know you can, you can be only convinced. And uh, he also had had his uh, callings. Uh, he actually you know was a, um, a, a I, IPS officer, and still started with I think physics, and then became IPS officer. And then he still continued with mathematics, which is kind of unusual, highly unusual. Um, and then uh, after his retirement, he has been very very uh, much involved in writing and presenting uh, the Indian civilization from 
textual point of view and also from astronomical uh, point of view. So I think each one of you have a great uh, work, experience, enthusiasm, your own calling. And I think all of us are interested in, in moving this idea forward so that the rest of the world understand. But before that, I think the rest of us understand as to where we are. So with that introduction, brief introduction, I would like to now request uh, Nilesh Ogye to make his presentation first, and then we will follow after him uh, with uh, uh, Kalyan Ramanji. Nilesh, you can go first. Namaskar. Now, do you, Balaramji, have a specific question that uh, I want you, I want, I mean, you want me to respond to? I, I will have a specific question later. If you want me okay. to ask a question, I can no, start no. that. But no, I think you know, I'll, I'll, let you, I'll let okay. you speak of what you think. Very good. Okay. So, uh, Namaskar, everyone. Uh, I had a pleasure of uh, meeting in person everyone here on the panel except Arunji. Uh, but Arunji, uh, I'm familiar with his work and uh, I frequently uh, make use of his uh, encyclopedic knowledge. So, uh, connected with everyone in uh, some fashion. So I'll give up my quick summary. This is a summary of my uh, 30 years uh, of research work. So as Balaramji said that uh, I was working in corporate world, but I did not necessarily think of this as a start and a stop, meaning I was working uh, on the subjects of my passion, I would say, the Indian history for a long time working in parallel. Uh, in fact, my uh, first uh, interview uh, in the corporate <coughs> world, working for G General Electric, and this was at a Toronto International Airport. This is going back 1996. And I was discussing Arundhati Vasishta observation with the person who was asking me questions. And I, at that time, I did not have an answer. Uh, it took me 14 more years. So if I have to quickly summarize my work, it, is, it goes something like this. I began with the chronology determination of the Mahabharata. Or rather, what I would say is I succeeded uh, first in defining the chronology of the Mahabharata. I was working in parallel, especially Ramayana and Mahabharata. And in case of Mahabharata, what I could able to do is I started with one specific observation, astronomy observation from the Mahabharata text. Uh, that is the Arundhati Vasishta observation, now very famous, uh, which simply said, Yachesha Visutta Rajas, Trailokya Sadhu Sammata, Arundhati Tayatesha Vasishta Prashtata Kruta. Now quick uh, history of this observation out of more than 130 plus different Mahabharata researchers who have come up with those many different dates. Uh, only four, astro, four Mahabharata researchers even dare mention it in their research. Uh, and what do they do? The other people simply don't mention it. And this is not some observation that one can easily miss. This comes in the Bhishma Parva and uh, there are four astronomy observations and every other Mahabharata researcher who refers to astronomy refers the other three, but not this one. And why that might be the case? Well, it is because it's, it was next to impossible to explain it. It was an enigma. Uh, great uh, Mahabharata researchers like C.V. Vaidya, Bharata Acharya C.V. Vaidya or Bharat Ratna Pawakane, they uh, simply describe this as simply impossible in the very order of nature, meaning astronomically it's impossible. Long story short, I worked on this for 15 years. Finally, in 2009, I could able to decipher it and decisively show in a very empirical, very objective, uh, testable fashion, in a scientific fashion, there was a specific interval. And only during this interval, anyone watching the sky from India or anywhere in Northern Hemisphere would have seen Arundhati walking ahead of Vasishta. Now, what was the big deal about it? Big deal was because Vasa is saying at the time of Mahabharata war, Arundhati is walking ahead. Whereas if you go last 6,500 years, starting with us going backward, Vasishta is always walking ahead of uh, Arundhati. So after that observation, actually, uh, Professor Achari is one of, the, uh, one of the Mahabharata researchers I contacted. He actually gave me the contact of uh, P.V. Kani and his book, The History of Dharma Shastra. And I found a lot of uh, useful information from P.V. Kani's book. Then I extracted 300 plus astronomy observations and think of it like a, solving a jigsaw puzzle, like a Rubik's cube, uh, crossword puzzle. And all those observations point me to a point anyone, they will point anyone looking at them to a specific year of the uh, specific year, 5561 BCE as the year of Mahabharata war. And since then, this is after 2011, I have looked at dozen plus different disciplines of uh, sciences. Um, uh, so oceanography, hydrology, geology, geophysics, geochemistry, seismology, 
uh, climatology, genetics, physical anthropology, you name it. And if the evidence exists in these fields, it points to again 55, 61 BC quickly. I did the same thing for Ramayana. Again, I was working in parallel, but uh, it was the Mahabharata that I was, I succeeded in doing it first. Uh, Ramayan, in case of Ramayan, I came across close to 600 astronomy observations. And again, when I put them together in a jigsaw uh, puzzle fashion, trying to solve it like a crossword, it points to a very specific year, 12,209 BC as the year of Ram Ravan Yuddha. And then very relatively recently, 2016, and actually Balaramji was uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, the cause of it. That he said, okay, so you have done this on Ramayana, you have done this on Mahabharata, have you done anything on the Rugveda or Saraswati? And that is when I started looking at Saraswati evidence, especially in the context of Rugveda, because I was familiar with Saraswati evidence from Ramayana and Mahabharata, but not so much from Rugveda, other than works of uh, Sri De David Frology or uh, Sri Kantalagiriji. And again, uh, by luck, I would say Daivam Chaivatra Panchama. I could able to establish somewhat tentative, but still a very solid foundation for the dating of Rugveda. And what I have said based on Sri Kantalagiri's relative chronology, it is that the latest mandalas like Mandala 10 are contemporary with the Mahabharata times, which is sixth millennium BC. And the oldest portion of Rugveda are definitely more than 22,000 BC or more than 24,000 years. That is my summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nileshji. That was a, a good way of telling historical things. Like we are talking about chronology, you presented your own chronology so <laughs> of, of this pursuit. Uh, now I want to go to uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman, who has been almost uh, a bhisma of this field. So uh, let him uh, present uh, whatever you want to present. I mean, uh, I know a historical thing is very important for you. But nevertheless, since you know everybody's work, please uh, comment on whatever, uh, if you feel appropriate what uh, Nilesh said, or uh, you can talk about your own and what you think the direction should be. Uh, can I share a screen, PowerPoint slides? Yes, you can, you can, you can share a screen. Okay. You are allowed, just, yeah. just go to your share screen. Are you able to see it? Yeah. See, the presentation is about the veneration of artisans in the Rigveda. There seems to be an indication based on the contents of the Rigvedic texts and the other Vedic texts that they seem to relate to the transition period from the Neolithic to the Chalcolithic, roughly from 8,500 years ago or approximately 6,500 before Carbon era marked by the development of metallurgy, leading to the running up to the Bronze Age and Iron Age. When arsenical bronze was in short supply, which is a naturally occurring alloy, tin bronze alloy was invented by a brilliant metallurgist who added tin to copper to create tin bronze. I suggest that the Rigveda is dated to the transition period into the Chalcolithic age. Let me take you through some pictures. There's evidence from Nahal Mishmar in Israel, a remarkable arsenical bronze hoard. The dating is still a work in progress, but it seems to be around the 5th millennium BCE. Look at the images. There are hieroglyphs of Karandava, aquatic birds, there are antelopes and there are mesas and a variety of shiny metallurgical articles. Amazing stuff. So just keep this as a background. Now let me take you on to the textual evidence of the Devi Suktam or the Rashtri Suktam, Rigveda 10.125. In the second richa, we hear this. I'll read it out. Aham, Somam, Ahanasam, Viparyaham, Tvastara Muta Pushanam Bhagam. Aham Dadani Dravinam, Havishmate, Suprapye, Yajamanaya Sunvate. 
the rough translation is i support this is by wilson based on sayana i support the for destroying soma first portion baga baga is a cognate of singh bonga in the austro asiatic tradition baga bonga bestow wealth upon the institute of the right right or the performance of yagna offering the oblation deserving of careful protection pouring forth the libation the objective is to create the dravid dravidam to create wealth in this there is i want to focus on one particular reference to an artisan called kashta pushan is the divinity of the pathway baga is the divinity of the shared wealth who is kashta i submit that he is an artisan of the saraswati sindhu civilization days this artisan is venerated in the rigveda chant it could be earlier than the sarasvati civilization days now who is this twashta this twashta is such a remarkable word it appears in almost all languages all languages of bharata varsha twashtra tatar goldsmith tatar alloy of copper and bell metal tatta ti tataran washerman tatte goldsmith tatta ti feminine gender of the goldsmith tatra vadu tulu goldsmith silver smith then in the indo aryan languages prakrit tatara toturu tataro tatiyar tatera tatero tatero tatera tatera hindi which means a brass worker the essential characteristics of the myth have been theorized as ultimately originated in proto indo european society around 2000 bce for the cognate word of tuisto or tuisco who is supposed to be the father of the germanic people we'll come to that so tashtra means carpentry work formed fashioned in mind produced tashtra is a vishwakarma song he is the first born invoked in the for the offspring he is the creator of bodies of men and artifacts he is a tashtra okay now let us take a look at twisto which i submit is a derivative from tashtra twisto in fact it is also called twisco twisto is derived from tashtra twisco is derived from taksha taksha and Tostru or synonyms. As it is recognizes Tuisto as the father of the Germanic people in Proto-Indo-European times. This is referred to by Jacob Alexander in his famous book Atman, a reconstruction of the cosmology of the Indian European Indo-Europeans. As I mentioned earlier, the essential characteristics of the myth of Tuisto have been theorized. ultimately originated in the proto indo european society maybe about 2000 before common era we don't know the date it's just only a guess work according to simak rudolf so as we have seen the meaning of the tostra is that of a carpenter the maker of carriages rathas for about the bodies of men animals so tostra is a very important component of creating a civilizational metaphor for the activities of the artisans life activities of the seafaring merchants is a taksha is a tashta in tamil is called tachan taksha is a carpenter tarkaran in pushto language is a carpenter taksham carpenter rigveda takshanam takshanam panini takhana tachan so all complete words so this is a characteristic of the meluha spoken form of the lingua franca of the civilization where transformations take place in the pronunciation of words which patanjali comments upon in his conversation with a cart driver and this is a very beautiful comment so here are some examples of ancient photographs of carpenters and smiths now this surprise what is this yagna about at least in the three ancient documents shukla yajurveda maitrayini samhita and kataka samhita a remarkable presentation is made of yagnena kalpantam made through yagna 
explained by Shatapada Brahmana and the Sayanas Bhashya. What are they purifying? What are they doing? Kalpanta? What are they producing? Ashma, stones. Vrittika, clay. Giraya, mountain stones. Parvatas, mountains. Sikatascha, sand. Anaspatayascha, herbals. Hiranyam, gold. Ayas, ayas, alloy metal. Shamam, some black metal, maybe iron, maybe anything else. Sisam, lead. Trapu. All these are made Yagnena Kalpanta. So, what are we getting here? The principal function of the Yagna seems to be for the purification of gold, tin, iron ore. So, can we? Reconstruct the chronology of this statement made in these Vedic texts following the Rig Veda and date them in the context of the Chalpolithic or Neolithic transition into the next phase. The Lithic Age, the Stone Age, gets transformed into Chalcolithic phase of carbon and then goes into the Bronze Age. Then there is an overlapping Iron Age. So we have archaeological evidences and a number of epigraphs, more than about 9,000 from the Indus Crit Corpora, which seem to indicate an incredible amount of metalwork that was done to create the wealth of the nation. So this objective of the Vasodhara Vaso, Vaso Mantra, Vaso is what? Creating wealth. So wealth creation is a very important component of life actually. That is recognized in all the Vedas. So I submit that the Vedic corpus, venerating Prashta, gives us a lead to date at least some of the Samhitas, like Shukla Yadur Veda, Vaita and Samhita, Ataka Samhita. And maybe the Rig Veda oral heritage, maybe earlier than these dates, could be 7th millennium or even earlier, we do not know. So it is impossible to find a fixed and exact date. That's my submission. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you, Kalyan Ramanji. So, the, just to get to people, audience who obviously understand this, you are saying that the Vedic period is at least 5,000 years ago or 6,000 years ago. Is that your submission? That's right, Balramji. In fact, it could be any time before, before. the 6,000 before Common Era. Yeah. Because yeah. we have archaeological evidence of Britana and Kunal where circular pit dwellings existed, which are the Vedic houses, as proven by Louis Renault. So the Vedic houses archaeologically attest to Bildana to be dated to 7th millennium BC. So if the Vedic time started at that time, and if these explorations of knowledge took place in the Vedic texts as a oral heritage, it will not be unreasonable to date it to 7th millennium BCE, coterminous with the archaeological findings of Mergard, where we have got several new artifacts of wheels, spoked wheels made. Sarka in Pushto means wheel. Arka means sun's rays. Arka means copper and gold. Arkasal means goldsmith workshop. So the sarka, the wheel, was a very important component proclaiming their competence in working with metals. So we are definitely getting into the metals age from the stone right. age. What when it happened, right. we do not know. Thank you so much. I think that's very clear. Wonderful. Uh, of course, you know, this is this does not go in any way uh, against or contradicts the what astronomical things are. So that will be, uh, that is, that makes sense. Uh, Narahari Acharji has been working on this for a very long time. And uh, so I think I would request him next, if he can um, uh, make his presentation. Can you stop uh, uh, sharing? Uh, Kalyan Ramanji, can you stop sharing? Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so I would request Narhari Acharji uh, to go next, and if he makes his uh, comments, and then you know we'll come back to some with some questions later. Okay. Uh, thank you, Balramji. Thank you, Kalyan Ramanji, and uh, thank you, Nileshji. Uh, my work goes back to at least 20 years, or probably a little earlier. 
and it touches upon both of the aspects that uh, Nilesh and Kalyan Ramanji have touched upon. Uh, I started with, as, a, as a, I'm a physics professor and I did not know astronomy at all. And then I was asked to teach a course in uh, astronomy for non-science majors. And I had to learn astronomy and teach my students. And that was summer. And so I used to prepare for the next class and go and blur it out. I don't know who had the more difficult time, me or my students. Anyway, I got through that summer. Then I realized that these courses, they teach about astronomy of China, Greece, and uh, uh, Islamic astronomy and so on, but not a word about uh, Indian astronomy. And I looked at 24 texts at that level. Only two texts mentioned anything about Indian astronomy and both were wrong. And one confused Buddha and Buddha. And the other one was uh, Rama was somebody else. And so that was the time I started to looking into Indian texts in astronomy and to learn about it. And one thing led to the other, and at that, that time, uh, a new software became commercially available. That's the plat planetarium software. Uh, the uh, desktop computers were just becoming powerful enough to run these large programs. And so I got into at that time. So the planetarium software projects the view of the sky anytime, any place in the world. But now there are hundreds of them available and quite a few of them are free. But anyway, uh, my first attempt was to see whether this could be applied to study the uh, dating of the Indian texts. And the first attempt was made to date the Shatapata Brahmana, which uh, Dikshit had said to be about 3000 BC, where the Kritikas rise exactly in the East. And I showed that, that that's quite true. And it's about 2970 or something like that. And then I re uh, answered all the objections that had been raised by uh, Pingri and others about accepting that view. And then it was Professor Kalyan Raman who suggested that I look into the chronology of Mahabharata. And uh, once I started on that, I got hooked into it. This was a very difficult subject because uh, I did not know much of Sanskrit or uh, the text. And the, um, the opinions of most of the scholars were that the astronomical information in uh, Mahabharata were unreliable, inconsistent. And so it, it's not uh, uh, useful to apply scientific methodology to that. So that was the situation. And then somehow I started on that. And then I thought I would use the uh, references in Udyoga Parva to see if that could be uh, simulated because the, uh, the, uh, the opinion of all the scholars about the references of Bhishma Parva was that is impossible to look at it. So anyway, fortunately, that was a, a very good choice because it turns out that using the references in uh, Udyoga Parva, one can actually derive the date of Mahabharata war. And it turns out to be unique date, 3067 BC. The first paper I presented was in a conference on Mahabharata in Montreal. And uh, then uh, there was a conference in Bangalore. And then uh, several places I, I presented papers and so on. And then that had continued. And then there was a lot of difficulty in actually to understand exactly how to interpret the Sanskrit shloka to understand the meaning and to use that to uh, in the astronomical context. Anyway, that confirmed the original uh, uh, work that the 3067 BC refers to the date of the Mahabharata war. And this is also uh, in conformity with the date of the Shatapata Brahmana, which is about 3000 BC. And then I turned into look into the chronology of Veda, and I started with the, Vilika, the work of uh, Tilak, and uh, uh, then looked into that, and have some, done some work on the structure and chronology of Rigveda. Rigveda is a mandala. Mandala is not a book. 
mandala refers to something that is circular and uh, one can see through that the uh, my hypothesis in this is that the structure of rigveda reflects the performance of soma yaga uh, the yaga which uh, uh, dr kalyan raman referred to and then that is actually the basis of the rigveda and uh, in, in doing so the uh, soma yaga is a very uh, important ritual and uh, it is the pressing of the soma juice and it is done three times day in, in that natha savana madhyandhya savana and tritiya savana and there are specific rituals that are to be recited at these uh, uh, pressings now is a, uh, there is no somyaga that can be performed without samaveda and so there are uh, recitations of from samaveda and from rigveda the recitations from samaveda are known as uh, uh, totras and the recitations from rigveda are shastras there are 12 shastras in uh, for the adhishtoma which is the basic form of uh, uh, somyaga and there are 12 uh stotras from uh, samaveda and these the specific requirements of the rituals shows that actually the first mandala of rigveda lays out the foundation for the performance of the somyaga and then the uh, other mandalas actually show how to do that and it turns out that the number of suktas in first mandala is exactly the same as the number of suktas in the 10th mandala which is 191 and it also shows why that number how that 191 arises and why this means uh, the first uh, mandala is the same as the 10th mandala there is also this is in uh, um, uh, aitreya brahmana says that in the somyaga the initial ishti is called the prayana ishti and the concluding ishti is called udayana ishti and they are to be similar exactly similar and if that is so then it says that it makes the somayaga like a, a shakala's serpent the tail is the same as the mouth and so it makes it a circle and that's exactly the reason rigveda is mandala the first mandala has exactly the same number of suktas as the 10th mandala so by, anyway based on this then one can look at uh, the asnamical references and going back to tilak and looking at uh, the references to uh, rishakapi uh, and um, uh, 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 ribhus and so on it turns out that both of them actually refer to the same event and that turns to be the date of about 7000 bce so there is a consistent chronology from about 7000 BCE for Rigveda. And of course, Rigveda also contains references to the, uh, the uh, equinox occurring at different nakshatras, and that can be dated continuously from 7000 to uh, uh, 3000. And uh, so there's a consistent chronology of Rigveda, Shatrata Brahmana, Mahabharata, and then one can go on to uh, the other uh, events in the Indian history uh, and so forth. So anyway, that's a brief uh, uh, outline of what I have to say. Unmute myself. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that's a very, very nice narration again. You know, we are telling, I'm, I'm getting the advantage of listening and learning about your own chronology of how you got into all this and this is, this is wonderful. Um, as, as it is true with anything and everything, we are all referring to text. You know, um, you're referring to text and how you got uh, some help from Dr. Kalyan Ram and others. I think the textual context and the meanings are very important. And uh, so I turn to Arun Kumar Padhyayji who has, like I said earlier in my introduction, treasure of information very sharply, very precisely, very applicable, very relevant to things that he can he, he can uh, get from various sources. 
So we'd like to know, and of course he has been interested in astronomical work. So we'd like to uh, ask him to um, chime in as to what he thinks of all this chronology and not only just chronology, but the meanings of these uh, chronological events that may have happened. Uh, there are physical meanings and there are metaphysical meanings. And, and also there are uh, textual references to those in the context that it might have happened. So kindly uh, elaborate on some of those aspects and anything else that you want to do. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Balram Singhji. And uh, it is an honor to talk with uh, scholars like Professor Narhari Achar Kalyan Ramanji. I have personally met Kalyan Ramanji and uh, Professor Balram Singhji. And yes. it is a pleasure to meet them again through this conference. My work started with astronomy only. In early childhood, at about age of six, I practiced multiplication and division by preparing horoscopes. So both astronomy and math education started together. My main interest was to calculate the uh, reverse uh, object. First, uh, horoscope is available. Then it's a time of birth I wanted to calculate but it is too difficult. And after I wrote commentary, uh, about 40 years after that, on Siddhant Darpan, then I started my original target and found the date of birth of Adi Shankarachal. On the very next day, when I found the <laughs> birth of Adi Shankarachal, I saw that one, uh, person had obtained the same date, Sripad Kulkarniji, uh, which I had obtained by astronomical. So I wrote him a letter how you could obtain it without astronomical calculation. So unfortunately, he expired on the very date when my letter reached him. Then his uh, grandson sent uh, me 18 volumes of his work on Indian history. And from that, I learned various aspects of time measures in Indian history or Puranas. So basic idea is that no time measures or units are in direct relation of each other. Like day, war, tithi, nakshatra, yoga, or karan, they don't occur in direct proportion. Like uh, we face problem in tithi calculation, tithis don't come regularly day after day. So we have to refer to another calendar, which is solar and uh, uh, which is continuous day reckoning. Similarly, for yoga calculation, we are depending on at least five sambatsar, pancha sambatsar mayang yugang. That is a <coughs> saying in Vedang Jyotish. It, it's a general common meaning is understood that uh, yoga means five years, but uh, Real meaning is that five types of sambatsar decide a yuga. So what are the yugas in historic reference? Most common yuga is of, uh, called Divya verse 360 years. Then uh, we have 60 year cycle of uh, joint cycle of Jupiter and uh, Saturn, which is called Barhaspati verse for Jovian years. Then we have uh, Saptarsi Sambatsar, which is described in two ways. One uh, version tells that it is of 2700 so, verse. Another version tells that it is 3030 years Manusvars. So here, uh, Divyavars means solar year only. And Manusvars means 12 revolutions of moon. Uh, which are in about 327 days. If you calculate, then both will tell you. Means 2700 solar years will be equal to 3030 Manus years, or human years, which is 12 revolutions of moon, not the lunar year. So here we understand that one meaning of the universe is solar year only. And it starts with the Uttarayan means uh, around 21st December. Then next year, uh, Sambhasar is 
Bharaspat ke samvatsar, uh, which I have stated earlier that it has 60 year cycle. But there are two types of cycles. One is in South India, which is Pitama system. We take solar year as the Jovian year. In North India, Surya Siddhant, later Surya Siddhant method, takes actual time of Jupiter in a Rashi, which is average time is 361 days, about four uh, hours. So in Northern system, which is called Surya Siddhant system, there are 86 uh, jovial years uh, in 85 solar years. So when both cycles combine, it will be a yuga of 5100 years, which was described in Adbhut Sagar by Ballal Sen in about uh, 1000 AD. So he had referred to Vishnu Dharmattar Puran. Uh, there are references that uh, when uh, in, at the time of Ram Avatar and Matsya Avatar, in both systems, it was Prabhavars. So we start the Jovian cycle with Prabhav years. There, that is the reason given there. So that way I calculated that both cycles were jointly coming, uh, I mean starting in 9,533 BC for Matsya Avatar and 4,433 BC uh, for Ram Avatar. So in those years they tally. Then uh, there is cycle of uh, Dhruvars, which is three times the Saptarsi year. That also has reference because it started with the death of King Dhru, which was a grandson of uh, Sayambhu Manu, uh, Dhruvars, or later on it was called Kronchvars, when Kartike attacked Kronchdeep, then it was called Kronchvars. So that is 8100 solar years. Then we come to our common yugas, Kali, Satyuk, Tra, uh, Treta, Dwapar, and Kali. We take it 12,000 Dibbivars, Generally, the we take as 360 years. Uh, but uh, for historical context, it is 1200 solar, 12,000 solar years only. And in many ways, it is uh, described in Puranas that uh, 12,000 solar years only constituted Yuga. In Surya Siddhant Astronomy book, we take uh, for calculation purpose 12,000 the means 12,000 into 360. But there also, Brahmagupta and Bhaskaracharya both have given correction cycle uh, that is called beach correction in cycle of 12,000 years only. And uh, if we take that formula, there will be two types of cycles. In one cycle, there will be negative correction. Another cycle, there will be positive correction. So one part will in start from Satyuk Treta. Dwapar Kali Yuga means for 4800, 3600, 2400, and 1200. That is our Sarpani. Second part will start in reverse way from Kali Yuga, Dwapar, Treta, and Satyuga. So 12,000 and 12,000, 24,000 years will be the called Brahmabdasya Dinatraya. It is written in uh, three Purana that it is currently it is third day of Brahmabd. One Brahmabd is 24,000 years and uh, its first part is Avasarpani, starting with Satyuk, Treta, Dwapar, and Kali, 12,000 years. Then in reverse way, another 12,000 years, that is Utsarpani. That way, if you calculate, then our major landmark, I will slightly differ with Acharji, once all the calendars, Panchangas are made with reference to the start of Kali Yuga era in 3102 BC, 17th February, and all the textbooks of Kerala have given their starting date and completion date in terms of day count from that day only. So whether it is mathematically true or not, we are counting days from that day only. So if we start from uh, uh, that day, means uh, end of Dwapar on that day, then the Brahmabd count starts from 61,902 BC. Then it is written that uh, in Satyuk there was no civilization from Treta. Uh, mining and agriculture started. It is written in three Vara Puran, uh, Brahman Puran, and Vayu Puran. It is well written that in Satyuk there was no civilization from Treta, that is 57,000 BC, mining and 
agriculture started uh, regularly there are uh, mines uh, of that era found in various parts of the world and uh, it is surprising even now and locating a mine of uh, copper or gold is a trial and error method there is no definite method in even in modern era that we can locate uh, all mines uh, in on earth surface how they could uh, do it in ancient times it is still a surprise for me and there must have been advanced civilization at some time and we cannot attribute everything to aliens from other planet so that is different thing so swayambhu manu period it, it is described in matsya puran brahman puran and uh, bhavishya puran that from swayambhu manu to start of uh, kaliyug in thir- 3102 bc there was a gap of 26000 years that is the precession cycle approximately at present uh, present value is about 25800 years or so so in puranas it has been taken as 26000 years matsya puran tells that uh, from swayambhu manu to vaivasat manu there was period of 16000 years approximately and 43 yugas means each yuga is of 360 years then from vaivasat manu to that 3102 BC, there were 28 yugas. But if you calculate from uh, this uh, yuga calculation, Vaivasat Manu, from Vaivasat Manu, Satyajuk, Treta, and Dwapar, they make up 10,800 years till 3102 BC. It will contain 30 yugas of 360 years. So Kumar Lal Jain explained that two yugas were having. Uh, glacial flood era, so they were not counted. So countable yugas are 28 only. That is written in Matsya Puran. So Vaivasat Manu period started from 31,902 BC. And after Vaivasat Yam, it is written in Brahman Puran and Brahm Puran that there was glacial flood. And after that, civilization restarted by Rishav Dev. And then Ikshvaku started Surjwans. From Ikshvaku, there is regular chronology or uh, rather list in the Puranas. So there was a correction in uh, Surya Siddhant also. It is written that due to glacial floods, Jalaprala, there was error in calculation. Now you can understand why there should be error. Because there, when there is glacial flood, there will be bigger load on the equator and earth rotation will slow down. That is why I take very old calculations by NASA software with uh, some reservation that there may be more errors than uh, what we expect in despite uh, 10 types of correction in Delta T they call. So for very ancient periods, it is not very accurate. That is my opinion. However, for Mahabharat period, it is accurate, no, not uh, very erroneous. And uh, there is another error that uh, Grahan cycle, eclipse cycle repeats in 18 years. So what we find uh, for one time that will reoccur after 18 years, 36 years, or even uh, the same period uh, backwards also. So it is uh, for exact date calculation, it is useful, but not for determining long eras. So we can uh, tell about these things uh, directly. So, Saptarshi period started uh, when Acharya tells 3067 BC, Laukik era started in Kashmir, and that was end of one Saptarshi cycle. Going backwards, uh, Dhruva period is uh, about uh, 26,000 uh, BC, then uh, Kashya period is 17,500 BC. We call uh, Shanti Path Aditir Jatam Aditir Janitram. Aditi is the Lord of Punarusu Nakshatra. And uh, in, in that period, Punarusu Nakshatra started the year. That was about uh, 17,500 BC when uh, Sun crossed equator uh, when it was in Punarusu Nakshatra. So that is confirmed. And it is also confirmed that from Kashyap to Vaivaswat Manu, there was 10 Yuga, means 3,600 years both ways that the calculation tallies. Then Kartike period is accurately given that Abhijit had fallen, uh, means uh, North Pole was 
deviating from Abhijit direction, and that was in about 16,000 BC. About 200 years after that, when sun entered in Dhanishtha Nakshat, then year started, which is described in Vedang Jyotirsha. So that was in about 15,800 uh, BC. Slightly before that, it was uh, about 1,000 years before Kartikeya was period of uh, Prithu, who uh, did systematic mining all over the world. That is written in many Puranas. So these are the major landmarks. And uh, another uh, thing is that uh, there was another long time calendar followed all over the world, 5,100 years, which I was telling. Uh, that was Mayan calendar. In India, we started Kalijuk from 3102 BC. But uh, Pitama cycle of uh, Jovian, Jovial year cycles in Pitama Siddhan that started 12 years earlier. That is 3114 BC. And uh, in Kalijuk, it was 13th year as per South Indian cycle. So Mayan calendar started in 3114 uh, BC and it was meant for 5100 years and it was to end in 2012 AD at the time, start of Uttarayan, means uh, 22nd December it was to end. That didn't mean that the uh, world will end. That was just end of a uh, one cycle of calendar and uh, thereafter next cycle would have started. That is the meaning. So the periods are given that Prithu uh, or uh, Chakshus Manu period means uh, about 3000 years before Vaivasat Manu, Chakshus Manantar started. That was period of Kartike, Vaman, Bali, etc. Then a short note uh, uh, and uh, after Ikshvaku, their periods are given. That Parshram period is ac accurately given. After that, Kulam Sambat started in Kerala and that is still continuing in Kerala. And uh, this Bahu Megasthenes also has written about 154 uh, generations of Indian kings that I have described in detail that I will not tell here now. Another thing is that uh, uh, every person's period is given in block of 360 years. That uh, in such and such period, this person happened. So 2400. So about Rig Veda the period, there is uh, no definite date. Our Puranas tell that all the 28 Vyases, starting from Swayambhu Manu to uh, uh, Badrayan Vyas at the time of Mahabharata, they compiled the Vedas in their own way. And at present, we are having the compilation by Ved Vyas only, means Krishna Devapan Vyas at the time of Mahabharata. Earlier, there was, up to the time of Kashyap, there was only one Veda. At the time of Vaman, whose guru was Bharadvaj, Vedas were divided into four uh, parts, Rig, uh, Yaju, Sam, and Rata. That is given in Mundipo uh, first part only, first five verses. So, present scheme of Vedas, not the present Sangita, that started in around uh, 17,000 BC. This is the scriptural evidence. I'm, I have not uh, confirmed it by astronomical calculation, but this is the Thank you. Thank you, Arunji. This is a wonderful. You know, the, so much information. Um, uh, all it goes to say uh, that you know the confusion is very well justified <laughs> because uh, because the, the different people are writing some of these things and their writing um, it depends on their perspective and also it depends on um, some of the traditions that people follow. I mean. Uh, uh, whether this is about the information or about their mindset or the kingdom or the situation, it seems, uh, I think, appropriate to accept that there are different uh, ways to calculate this. One of the things, uh, I mean, from my perspective, I'm, I'm very much interested in philosophical aspect of some of these things, and you mentioned about yugas. Now, uh, in Bhagavad Gita, I say, Sambhavami Yuge Yuge, uh, which which sometimes literally might mean like, well, you know, when there is a yuga, then there will be a uh, incarnation. Well, we, so far we know from various sources and some, a lot of the, that you told, there are only 10, 10 avatars so far, you know, what we consider the 10 avatars. If we consider that to be yuga yuga, then that will be a, a very limited 
description of that. So, so I think what you are saying is there have been so many sources uh, throughout the length and breadth of India, and perhaps maybe greater India at one time. And everybody has their own perspective in terms of either text or in terms of the time, or you're talking about the flood. But one of the things that will be interesting, and I want to go back to Nilesh, is that uh, astronomical things, if they are mentioned, can be, uh, Narhari Acharji has done the same thing as Nilesh has done. You can go back. But this one caveat that I thought about after listening to Arun uh, Kumarji, that you know, we talk about you know the whole universe started with Brahma's uh, one day and one night. Is that all that counts? And Brahmaji has hundred days to live, whatever. So if that were the 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 time of uh, universe, then we are talking about at least from modern physics point of view, you know, thirteen billion years or so, at least at least one cycle of universe. And then Brahmaji is with us only only one day and one night. And then he has a hundred. So these these astronomical because the whole thing apparently created was created according to that let's say Big Bang theory or whatever we want to use it for, the whole stars were created. So they can be created and recreated. And so whatever you are seeing is maybe true only for now, may not be true for all the time. And if the information is there for very very long time, then it may be more confusing than what uh, Arun Kumarji just said. Nilesh, what do you think of that? Namaskar. It was wonderful listening to everyone. And uh, Arun Kumarji, I mean, I have listened, to, I have read many of his uh, posts. And uh, just a summary, what a wonderful summary. And to digest will take, uh, digest will take some time. And actually to use them meaningfully will even take many years. I mean, decades of work. Uh, what a great source of knowledge. So just a quick summary to what I, everything I heard. I mean, directionally, at least everyone is comfortable going beyond that 3000, 5000 um, BC as a time for Indian civilization and beyond. And some people may want to restrict it. But quickly to a specific uh, question that you asked, uh, if this universe has been formed and more formed uh, multiple times, how do we relate to say astronomy phenomenon? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, for example, let's look at uh, just briefly, I'll go with what uh, I'm most familiar with, say the Mahabharata and Ramayana. The way astronomy is described or the astronomy references made in Mahabharata and Ramayana, so all the nakshatra system that is referred to, for example, if you go back, if one goes back in time, say beyond 100,000 and specifically more than say 150,000 years, so 150,000 years in the past, if you go and beyond, then the current nakshatra system that we are using or the, way, the current meaning, the way we use it in our times, or the way it is described in the Mahabharata or the way it is described in Ramayana simply would not exist. Some of the stars move so far, so far away. For example, Swati and Rohini, and I'll not go into the details, that they cannot be nakshatra. And of course, uh, um, uh, Arun Kumarji referred to the position of Brahma Rashi or uh, Abhijit or Vega uh, becoming a pole star. But that's a periodic that will come back and forth. But Rohini and Swati are wonderful. They, they will just move away. So my point is that kind of gives us 150,000 years ago as a upper limit for a use of the modern astronomy or the Indian astronomy that we have. So that puts the upper limit. Okay. But but your, your uh, Nilesh, your calculation for my conversation, not that you mentioned today, is that you put uh, age of Vedas at least 22,000 years yeah, before 22,000. Like yeah. So quickly, I'll come to that because I, I, uh, I don't know if anyone uh, on the panel had a, a objection to thinking of a Veda before, say, I don't know, say 10,000. So I'll use that 10,000 as a number. Certainly, Arun Kumarji did not. I mean, he was referring to 31,000 BC of Vaivaswata, Manu, and so on. Um, the, the, the way I arrived at uh, the dating for Rugveda is simply this. Uh, in Rugveda, we have a description to Saraswati. For example, it is described as Naditame, Ambitame, Devitame, Saraswati. One of the oldest mandalas, oldest mandalas based on the work of Srikantala Giriji. And I understand some people may not agree with Srikantala Giriji's relative chronology. And I don't consider that sacrosanct as well. I consider that that, that is the best as of now. And if someone can uh, falsify that, that's great. 
I mean, I'm not attached to my own claims. Why would I be attached to <laughs> Srikanth Lagiriji's relative chronology? But the point is, Nadi Tame Ambi Tame Devi Tame Saraswati. This comes in 6, 3, 7, 4, 2, the oldest mandalas. Or Giribhya Asamudra. So Giribhya Asamudra is the easy reference to explain. What it is saying is that is the biggest river that is flowing from high mountains all the way to the ocean. And we have three wonderful papers. And actually, there are 35 papers that they're sitting here. But three papers of uh, Kunde, 2014, 2016, 2017. And what he showed is very important. He showed that there was indeed a great river going through where we think the Saraswati uh, region is, starting with the mountains, going all the way to the ocean in India. But then he also shows with his research, geophysics, geochemistry research, that there was no such a grand river flowing from all the way to the, uh, from the mountains to the ocean in the last 10,000 years which means the river, that great river existed, going all the way to the ocean existed before 10,000 years ago. And that, if you start looking at other references, and I'll quickly give you example what I mean by other references. Mary Corti, 1986, uh, Henry Frankfurt, 1992, uh, Clift, 2012, 2017, uh, Singh from IIT, then The Way, and many, many others. All of their work basically supports this because what it shows that so Yamuna separated from Saraswati uh, sometime between 50,000 years to 40,000 years ago, and Satluj separated from Saraswati in 13,000 BCE. So after that, Saraswati became smaller and smaller and eventually uh, disappeared sometime after 4,500 BCE, and people put different dates. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think that is, that is helpful to put uh, things in context where we can try to use some of this information. It's not that easy to use a state to just ordinary people as to what mm -hmm. it is. I mean, so it, it just, it is really is um, complicated and complex. And we, we have to find some way to communicate that, that complexity is there, but then in general, whatever we are saying is also true. Uh, so I want to go back to Narhariji that, uh, you know, you got, uh, it, it, it basically propelled yourself into this and brought some uh, astronomical calculations, which I think was very big relief to people like me, that at least there is somebody who is doing this calculation based on some reference point. But what do you think of its meaning now? Now that you have not only have worked for so long and you got, you know, you said you got hooked into this when, when you started working on Mahabharata and Mahabharata is anybody can get hooked. It's not because of chronology. It's because of the, the amount of information that comes. There are various aspects of life that shows up. We really, uh, we have nothing but to get hooked onto it because everything almost you can get to see it. But the, what do you think of the meaning now that, you know, we, we, this maybe the chronology is very complex and it could mean different things in different contexts like Arunji is saying and also Nilesh is saying. So what do you think of now that the fact that you did mentioned something and that did trigger a lot of work and a lot of thinking. But what do you think now should be the, the, the next step in how, what, what do you stand in that? Uh, thank you, Balramji. And thanks to uh, Arun Kumarji for bringing out all the details from the Puranas. Uh, we have to think about two different things here. One is cosmic time, which relates to the creation of the universe and the destruction of the universe, it's a very, very long time. The other one is the local time, in the sense that the time uh, range we are living with, this is amenable to uh, astronomical calculations regarding the position of the stars and planets and so on, but not that cosmic time, because that's beyond this. We can only say, oh, this could have happened, that could have happened, but nothing particular. Now, when it comes to uh, Mahabharata, the uh, dates that are obtained are by specific references to astrological uh, events, in the sense that uh, if Shani is here near Rohini, it, it causes something, that kind of a thing. And so one can infer from that, that within the reasonable short time, where was Shani at Rohini. For example, in Udyoga Parva, it says, Prajapatyam hi nakshatram. Uh, that is the, Prajapati nakshatra is uh, Rohini. 
Rohini is afflicted by Shen. And uh, Varaha Mehra says, for any nakshatra to be afflicted by Shani, it has to satisfy certain conditions. And uh, let me see what it says here. Um, had it somewhere. Uh, for nakshatra to be afflicted, Ravi Ravi Sutta Bhoga Magatam, Kshitu Sutta Bhedana Vakra Dushitam, Grahanagatam, Atha Ulkyo Hatam Nityam, Ushakara Pid Tantra. So, Ravi and Ravi Sutta is Ravi's son, Ravi Sutta is Saturn. For them to afflict a nakshatra, they have to be Bhoga Magatam, they have to be near that nakshatra. Kshitu Sutta, Kshitu Sutta is Mars. In order for the nakshatra to be afflicted by Mars, it should be bhedana. It's called a piercing. And then vakra dushitam. It, the motion of angarika should be re retro near that nakshatra. Or in that nakshatra, it could be grahanagatam or ulkyahatam. It can be either an eclipse or a meteorite. So these are the conditions under which a nakshatra can be said to be afflicted. For example, in the Udyoga Parva, when it says, Prajapatyamni nakshatram shanaishraha pirayati. Here, Saturn is afflicting Rohini nakshatra. That means Saturn must be near Rohini. No other possibilities are there. And so we can use that uh, thing to find out where can Rohini be uh, yeah. So uh, Saturn is a period of about 29.5 years. And so if Saturn is near Rohini now, it will be here again 25.5 years later and so on. So one can look at in a short period range, say for example, from about uh, 4,000 BC to say current time, where uh, how many times can Rohini be near, uh, how many times can Saturn be near Rohini? That fixes essentially the year in which Mahabharata war could have taken place. And then if you look at the other one, the, because uh, Karuna mentions the Vakra motion of uh, uh, Angaraka, and then it's, it has to be near Jeshtha Nakshatra. So in those years, if you see how many times can Angaraka be near uh, uh, Vakra near Rohini or near, near Jeshtha Nakshatra, then it turns out that out, uh, it, it reduces that number of years. And from that, then you can go to look at the calculation of the eclipses. And that actually brings down the year in the range eh, from about 4,500 to current year to only two years, 2,183 BC and 3,067 BC. All the four astronomical events mentioned in Udyoga Parva happen in these two years. But those themselves are not enough to decide which one of them should be the uh, year in which the war could have taken place. For that, we look at the uh, textual evidence from Mahabharata itself. Uh, and some people interpret the shloka from Krishna to uh, Karna. There is going to be an Amavasya from seven days from now. Let the uh, Sangramam let the war, some people interpret that as let the war begin on that Amavasya. The interpretation is let the war rituals begin on that day. And so this, considering the sequence of events, and we can show that the war could not have begun on an Amavasya. And then because the 14th day of the war, uh, anyway, there's going to too much details, but uh, it turns out that uh, 367 turns out to be the year. So we have to look at the uh, long duration of the cosmic time, and we cannot hope to calculate that in any way. We can only make approximations. And uh, so the, the calculations that we're using, using the astronomical software are only good for short range of period. And uh, that's my that make That makes perfect sense again to say that things are very complicated. And especially yeah. the reason that has that claims to not only one uh, universe time, but multiple and all universal time. 
<laughs> and that just adds that but i think your comments about astrological and astronomical i think is very important so astrologically i i, I don't know if that's what you really meant you said that you know there were some astrological references and astrological sometimes people tell you know certain things to do at certain times in my life for example so in my own life cycle these planets uh, planetary movements go uh, several times and sometimes if they are referring to that that is a very different life cycle that like you you are talking about and but but if we confuse that to um, my life if people started talking about you know how much is the sunny's life how much is the mars and then some somebody somewhere you know let's say 5000 years from now had my astrological chart reading and said balram singh must have lived for you know whatever 50000 years or something like that which is probably not very relevant uh, at that time, maybe actually misunderstanding because sometimes people think rama lived for 80000 years or something like that i have heard and that just looked like preposterous so i i, I mean, while you think about that i want to go to kalyan raman ji because he is the one who really brought this historical archaeological information and because that's important to make sense you know in and make sense uh, not only just for us but also in the context of us and when others are referring and you know there is a dominating forces at least for last 2000 years or so who have uh, systematically try to undermine and they continue today intellectually to undermine some of the things that are complex yet not exactly the way they are defined by the western world maybe simplified they and they maybe don't need to be simplified i mean the fact that there are a lot of things in chemistry for example very complex and we just accept that that's very complex and then this is what we know there is nothing no reason to have to explain everything to be acceptable Yeah, that's just not the nature of the thing so what do you think of now from your perspective you know have done so much work and with so much dedication and a mission you know to make sense to people what is does it you know this whole complexity how do we you think derive uh, back to uh, some sensible thing historically and culturally and traditionally balram ji you have brought out a very beautiful point see we have there are multiple levels of memories one level could be a faith based system or from pramana of the vedas it is also enshrined in a number of vedic texts we believe that that's it when my grandmother tells me that saraswati joined the ganga and yamuna in prayer i believe her only thing is we are not scientifically been able to prove how did this happened was it part of yamuna carrying the saraswati waters joining at prayag because of the plate tectonic events related to the cosmic dance of the himalayas we have a metaphors we have kailasa nata sitting on top of the kailasa parvatam and out of his jata emerges these great rivers and we venerate him with continuous oblations of water dripping of water so he is a water giver himalayas are water given so this metaphor has got to be interpreted we can do it in our own way one possibility is that we have to look at it in civilizational terms how do you define civilization and distinguish it from culture raja ji defined culture very beautifully culture is an automatic pattern of good behavior so rama might not have been civilized in terms of wearing beautiful kurtas and pajamas and so on but he was a very cultured person so ravana was a very cultured person he was a devotee of kailasanatha so this metaphors are what to be understood in their context now i'll refer to one particular word which uh, arun upadhyay ji karun kumar darshan about the later the kali yuga which has been enshrined in our tradition how can we deny the tradition for thousands of years in hundreds of inscriptions kali yuga is referred to as the date of reckoning of an event that is recorded in history we depend on epigraphy as a source of history so when we are reconstructing a period of proto history and bringing it to the area of domain of history where we can understand the activities of the people say of the vedic people or the mahabharata people and explain them we have got to use the civilizational markers so one of the civilizational markers is the word called kali kali is a word that occurs in the atharva veda 
and Chattapada Brahmana. And it's also referred to as one of the Yugas in the Vedic texts. So with the tradition linked to this Kali, which is a Dai, a Dai is game that is the centerpiece of the entire Mahabharata. The Dai is game that determines the fate of people. Daivyam, the divine intervention, the providence that happens. So that's how the explanation takes place in terms of the astrological events that Narhari was mentioning. So we have got to make a very clear distinction between the astrological markers and the astronomical markers. So Narhari made a very beautiful commentary on the word graha. It has been accepted in our etymological framework, chronological framework of the word graha. It refers to both a planet and a comet. So if you use the word graha as a comet in a particular context, we get a different meaning of the text. So there could be different interpretations of the same text and arrive at different dates. And question saying here, they are astrological, they are not reliable, they are old wives' tales. No way. Our ancestors were remarkable people. They saw the Pramana of the Vedas. They expressed themselves so beautifully. So they were quest for knowledge. That is the meaning of the word Veda, with knowledge. So that knowledge acquisition, knowledge inquiry resulted in the determination of the dates to which they belong. So if the Yuga is mentioned in the Vedic context, we have got to be respectful of the tradition in determining what date could be referred to. So I think the work done by Arun Kumar Upadhyay, the Yerai Shok, Narahari Acha, are very important components in resolving this major enigma of our civilizational story. So I am announcing a civilizational epigraphy as a new discipline in artificial intelligence, like the way Google did a driverless car. Let us go through all these pictures, epigraphs, hieroglyphs of the Indus script. Let us try to understand them and to relate the words to the spoken tongue, the lingua franca of the civilization. I call it Meluha, the Mlecha. Mlecha is a pronunciation, mispronunciation of words that explains why in our Indian languages we have same core word getting different pronunciations. One call it Katan, one call it Katar, and so on and so forth. And Germans call it Tuisto, Tuisko, Taksha, Tachan, and so on. So this resource of enormous information available in millions of words of our 25 plus languages will be a resource which you can use to resolve the differences of opinion that come up by using only one discipline. So we should have a multidisciplinary approach to studying the civilizational epigraphy and create an artificial intelligence framework. I recommend this artificial intelligence framework also for another reason. The Indoscript, for instance, employs the semantics of the words, red rebus, similar sounding words, and introduces a semantic layer over the data encryption method. So it can be a very strong method for improving the data encryption standards, which can contribute to artificial intelligence, just together with machine learning. In fact, Google has now started a culture project called the Google Fabricus, with which the Sydney University in Australia is associated. We can have a larger project of this kind with the semantics of the Indescript for our civilizational epigraphy. That's my submission. Namaskarji. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. I think this idea of artificial intelligence, I think, will be maybe appreciated very highly with Arun, by Arun Kumarji because he has so much information. The Arun Kumarji can be a very important part of this, and, and as are others, to how to stack it. You know, I think the, the, the I mean, we are dealing with this, um, not only our civilization, but we are also dealing with, that is, I'm, I'm talking about Vedic civilization, but also we are talking about Western civilization which has a very dominant uh, discourse, framework, and in which they put everything. So uh, a civilization that talks about billions and billions of years and the origin like cosmologically talking about that very complex, and then simply talking about, you know, these tithis and nakshatras changing every day and we, we uh, uh, operate according to them also. Sometimes the names are the same. And then it becomes, you know, it, you do a Google, somebody who only works on Google today, they will find a, a problem. So what I want to 
to come to you is what do you think of uh, Kalyan Ramanji's idea and particularly in the context of the rest of the world that how they look at it and then from your perspective if you if you have uh, paid attention to this is that in all these texts how the rest of the world was uh, referred to in all these texts and then only I think we may be able to then refer that this is what they have referred and today we can refer to that and perhaps communicate to them at that level. You know, when I talk to a chemist, I talk in chemistry. When I talk to, you know, my, my folks <laughs> in my village, I talk to them, you know, in my Audi language and, you know, talk about all the whatever that is needed. They don't even ever think that I'm a professor, you know, <laughs> sometimes they get confused. There was one guy in my village, once he was asking me, what do you do? You know, I was talking to him in, in, you know, just like the people used to come and see me when I go from here. And um, he said, what? Well, ultimately he asked me like two, three digits after I, I came to United States. He asked me, what do you do there? And I said, oh, I teach there. He said, really? He said, I, so then he says, do they understand our language? I, I, because he never thought that I speak anything in any other language than the one I was talking to him. He said, do they really understand this language? I said, no, I do speak another language. So anyway, what I'm trying to say with that is that communication is the key and stacking of information, what I think Kalyan Ramanji is beautifully saying that maybe using artificial intelligence. So when, you know, we can almost ask like, you know, Ayurveda question, what vata, pitta, kapha you are, and then that's where you need to go to. So if, you're, if your label is, is this, this is what you understand. Now, you, this is the stake is important for you. What do you think of that? Arun Kumarji, you're, you unmute yourself and please make comments. It's not unmuted yet. Yeah, he has to ask to unmute. Ah, it, yes. I think there is no question for me. And no, the, this question was, did you not hear what I said? You know, the the information that you have, you talked about so many ways, Puranas, mm -hmm. and talking about the whole cosmology, talking about uh, um, what you were talking about, different kind of Manus. And so there is a, there is a, this label of information needs to be stacked so that people can uh, access to the label that they might be uh, interested or they might, that might be worth useful for them. Uh, that's what I'm asking. So I have written this uh, stacking what you are telling from 57,000 BC. I have compiled the chart. There may be some correction, but uh, it gives an, a useful idea of the chrono uh, relative chronology, you can say. And uh, it deals about the other countries of the world also. Like uh, North America was called Crunch Deep. Even South America, uh, America has been, Uruguay has been mentioned in earlier texts that uh, from Bali's place, first step of Waman or was uh, east part of Indonesia, next step was in Uruguay. That way it has been mentioned. So these places have been mentioned at Crunch Deep, uh, North America was called Crunch Deep because North America and Rockies Mountain, both are in the shape of flying bird in the, on the map. But that is also written in Mahabharata that uh, they are shaped like a crunch bird. Fantastic. Great. Uh, Africa also has been mentioned. Even Antarctica has been mentioned. And uh, Antarctica has been mentioned by Arjvat also. Arjvat and uh, Lal. So all the uh, zones are mentioned in two ways. That uh, That is uh, another subject. I will send you the slides of... Uh, my analysis. Uh, we were dividing in eight zones uh, for mapping purpose. So India zone was called uh, Bharatwars map, means uh, up to North Pole. And there are other four quadrant, quadrants in the South Pole, four quadrants in the North Pole. Indian quadrant was divided into seven locals from equator to North Pole. And other quadrants, uh, three in north and four in south, were called Tal or Patal, seven Patals. Seven Patals are not on, in the space. They are only on Earth's surface. But seven Lokas are in space also, on Earth also. That is the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Kalyan Ramanji wanted to say something. Yeah, I wanted to add one thing, Palramji. 
We have a fantastic resource created by University of Chicago called the Schwarzberg Atlas. A group of scholars, including our great late Hugh Vajpai, yeah. constructed this atlas. It's magnificent. They try to pick, pull out the names of the people of different regions and mark them in this atlas, primarily related to South Asia. So the atlas is a very solid source of material that is available to us to determine the civilizational framework within which the life activities are taking place. So the Schwarzberg Atlas, before it disappears by the end of December, as a accessible through flash, must be made available to all the children to take a look at what this Bharata Varsha is, what these Bharatam Janam are, mentioned in the Rigveda 3.53.12 by Vishwamitra. So who are these Bharatam Janam? That is a better venerating and this is my mantra will protect these people of Bharatam Janam. So this Bharata Varsha has to give us our identity and we have to resolve this major issue of identity problem that we have faced by a lot of distortions that have occurred from Eurocentric racist perspectives. We have got to change that. Oscar. Thank you. So I want to go back to Nilesh and I want to give a little bit of introduction. I know you all are kind of familiar with what I have done, a uh, little bit of work that I have done. My interest is really in the yuga and and uh, and I try to understand the philosophical meaning of it. But I have uh, actually, uh, Kalyanamanji, last time you came to here, I was at UMass and I have taken retirement from there. And I have set up a, a, an institute of my own. It's called Institute of Advanced Sciences, where uh, we do some, uh, some aspect of uh, research and you know, I'm just putting my background changing so that you know where I am coming from. Um, and it has been wonderful to have uh, all this knowledge and interaction, particularly for me, because I was not familiar at all with any of this. And I have my own understanding and question, my own interest now that I study. But uh, I want to go back to Nilesji because the, 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 the thing that you're talking about, University of Chicago, Nilesji, I think, Nilesji has been a faculty at our institute now. And it has, uh, I will talk to maybe uh, Skalyana Menji, sometimes I'll give you a call and talk to you about, you know, what the, the various things we are trying to do. One of them we are trying to do is um, uh, the INETS, as it is uh, referred as its acronym, Institute of Advanced Sciences, INETS World Campus. We are developing an INETS World Campus and in which we have a, a vision that hopefully will ma match with some of the practices of Vedic times for education. And so in, in that context, I want to ask this question to Nelesji that not only to perhaps find a way to get that information and maybe immortalize that in, in digital world so that we have it for like what Kalyana Manji is saying. But I think more importantly, Nelesji is, is, is a, is a uh, the next step thing, what we need to do in terms of communication, not only you know whatever will be available is stacking and the information that Arun uh, is saying, but how do you see this in terms of uh, being communicated uh, effectively and with love and care? You know, we are, you know it's it's okay. People have done some mischievous things, but that we we need to be better at that, and we need to and be unfortunately or unfortunately we live in the Western world. And we have access to some of these people. And I have, uh, Kalyan Ramanji made many people very uh, the personal friends. You know, I, even though I know most people uh, is scholarly, either whether in science or non-science. But when I have gone down to that level where you meet these people, they are in awe when they understand that this is what they have misunderstood. They are in awe. So I think there is a, a an opportunity and Corona is really providing this to a, a lot better because you know the the last uh, as as people say the fat lady has not sung <laughs> as yet about the corona uh, so that means the things are still uh, in the, the pipeline whether this is related to vaccine or the treatments and India and Ayurveda is becoming very very important I know some of the stuff that I'm myself involved so what I'm trying to say that there is a uh, there is a very nice uh, opportunity of communicating this complexity in a way that people can at least begin to climb that, you know, uh, those steps to eventually realize not only because it is true and it is important and it is useful, but 
given the population genetics information that the rest of the world accepts kalyanaman ji that 70000 years ago everybody almost virtually everybody in this world has come out of indian subcontinent and so that there is no any this is this is not indians claiming this is the rest of the world is claiming so they are in some sense children of ours uh, is so to speak our ancestors they they just went out just like i have come to united states some day i may be just considered i you know my culture my language my uh, food and all that stuff oh this is in america but actually really i did come from india maybe people will not be able to keep it some day or maybe my children will not be um cool uh, premi enough <laughs> to keep it <laughs> they may be i mean i wouldn't i don't want to call them kuldrohi but they may be you know kul uh, bismriti they may not understand this some day and uh, but that may if they are kul premi i am sure they will keep it so i think sometimes when we remind them when i i see the, the western world people like i said you know scientists great scientists they can well accomplished people when they see it they really recognize it i think there is this uh, this string this uh, element this strain in them that they want it because that's truth and so uh, anyway i made this very long <laughs> prologue i'm i'm giving you this question um, nilesh ji and uh, that may be actually the end of our our conversation but you know please go ahead okay thank you so if i understand your question uh, you said how, what is the effective way to uh, take this kind of research uh, if we can use the phrase dumb down or yeah. you know or make it uh, appropriate for each level how do we do it i'll quickly mention my evolution in this area and that actually answers that question as i see it i started with of course uh, learning and uh, reading from everything that was existing and comprehending it so it starts with that tapasya then i my, my journey started with writing a book so it was through the books then i came to blogs and then i came to uh, giving a public lecture so that started uh, lecture started 2016 but as you said we have uh, wonderful access to technology improving technology so since then since 2016 beyond these three modes of uh, communication i have taken to uh, social media like two specific areas the twitter and uh, facebook and i did not want to go to the either but there is one group called bharat rakshak forum and some of you may be aware of it but many people there i mean there are like 8000 plus uh, folks there and many requested me pleaded me say you must come to facebook and you must come to twitter and that's how finally i yielded and i came to facebook and twitter so that's one now going beyond that what i am doing is i am mentoring a few students and i'll just mention uh, not i shouldn't say student i'm mentoring few researchers and i'll mention uh, somebody's work but uh, going beyond like people's uh, attention span is getting less and less with this uh, social media and so i'm working with the movie makers i'm working with the documentary makers i'm working with uh, a novelist so people who want to write novels based on the indian narration but in their novel they can embed some of the new data new wonderful researches that are coming out and actually i would say right now there are uh, close to 10 uh, individuals who are working on their projects and they are embedding the information the research that i have i have brought to the show and uh, uh, so couple other points quickly wanted to mention the multidisciplinary evidence is that's what exactly what i work on like you name a discipline and if uh, it's a scientific discipline and a data exists i have done something in it or at least i try to understand and try to relate to it uh, recently i did one sugriva's atlas and uh, arun arun kumar ji i think mentioned like uh, some other text mentions antarctica and what not and aryabhatiya mentions it absolutely he does and sugriva this defines the geography of his time 14000 years ago for starting with india all the way to south america in the east direction all the way to antarctica in the south direction all the way to arctic sea in the north direction and all the way to alps in the west direction so yes i mean uh, we can uh, start making the connection to the rest of the rest of the world and quickly last point on the astronomy uh, it is true that we don't have a independent or we did not have a independent standard to see how far back we can take the uh, algorithms of modern astronomy what i would like to assert and this is open for uh, people to critique it is that my dating of the mahabharata in 5561 bc or for the ramayana in 12209 bce has actually shown 
that the Ramayana references and Mahabharata references can be used as the calibration standards, golden standards, to validate the algorithms of modern astronomy. So I will end on that note. Thank you. This has been wonderful. The great, great uh, learning for me. I think uh, the only, uh, maybe one or two points I would like to mention. One is, like I just said, uh, we, we are offering uh, Nile Sok and he's working on it. Uh, that will be in, in INET's World Campus, we will have Nilek, Nile's Oak School of Archaeo Astronomy as an example, which would mean that uh, you know, it's very important to understand that uh, it is his independent thought. It is his, like he's mentioning so much work that is already going on and a lot of people are already interested in that. Uh, so if we present that in such a way, Nile says maybe I, and you need to talk further about it. Maybe you have already thought about it. Is that, and it's important for all of us to think, is that unless we make it relevant to people's lives, it either does not get counted or many times countered. So I think it's very important to, and what I, whatever uh, Kalyan Ramanji, I think about my work now, I'm working on Ayurveda as an example. I mean, some aspect of Ayurveda, which is more biochemical and the thing, because that's what I, I people will be able to uh, appreciate from my group. But also its relevance, Ayurveda is not just a chemicals and not just herbals. It is really a lifestyle. And this lifestyle comes from this knowledge that the whole cosmos, we belong to this whole cosmos. And we need to uh, un have that understanding and that, uh, that kind of uh, a lifestyle in which, for example, we have the dates. You know, we are talking about the dates or the days I have spoken about this before. We, this all these seven days are not mentioned in Mahabharata or in in Ramayan. The, the way they are they are they have wa, they called war you know the Buddha war war Vasar I think that they, but they don't have this Somwar Mangalwar Buddhawar Brihaspatiwar. This is unnatural. Our things are tithis, which is natural. You that's the first way to connect. You know we, we connect with sun, we connect with the moon. And the moon is the one who changes, so it's much easier to connect with rather than solar, which takes a long time to change. So I think some of these practical things are in Ayurveda as an example. Ayurvedic way of uh, food or living and sleeping and, and seasons and things like that. So I think uh, if we can make it relevant, something like that, and then he, the same way about history, you know, the things have happened, but we need to learn from that rather than just accuse each other again, going back to the historical. So then I think people kind of find it more use. I hope that this discussion has uh, made some uh, baby steps in that direction. And I hope that we will continue to uh, engage each other. I think in the, your great work that you are doing, I hope that I will get connected with you all to give me some ideas about the, the INETS World Campus. And I hope that uh, people like Nilesh uh, do succeed in you know, moving this forward to communicate these great ideas from the, the place that we are, are very fortunate to have our birth. And thank you all very much. And Babes is obviously very grateful to, for your time and, uh, and contributions throughout your, your work that you have done, but particularly for this panel discussion. Thank you so much. Namaskar.